off and away. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, my name's Tom Knockholds from Community Power Agency and co-presenting tonight, we have um, Kylie from Clear Sky Solar, Kylie Hello. Hitchman, sorry, um, and Adam Blakester from uh, Starfish um, Initiatives. Um, Kylie is going to be talking about uh, the Clear Sky uh, case study and, and first-hand experience of, of, of being involved in that model. And Adam's going to be talking about the Lismore Community Solar Farm model. Um, so we're going to be copying a very similar format to what we did last week with the donation models. I do need to step you through the very basics just in case anybody is joining these webinars for the very first time. Um, but I'll try and run through that fairly quickly. Um, be aware that this is the fourth webinar um, on the small scale community solar guide. Um, uh, the first webinar is an introduction. And if you haven't seen that, I strongly recommend that you check it out. The second one explains a, a major new section, the, the common legal structures. And if you're interested in donation models, you, you'll also find a recording of the donation models webinar. So um, why are we here today? Well, um, the background to this story is that the Coalition for Community Energy um, back in 2015 um, developed the National Community Energy Strategy. And a part of that was the first edition of this small scale guide. It was Appendix E, um, and it was part of the broader project that was funded by ARENA. The lead author was the Institute for Sustainable Futures, and it was a real collaborative approach. A um, bunch of organisations contributed towards this guide, which was really intended at, at showcasing the models of small scale behind the meter solar um, projects that had been proven to work. The purpose being so that other people can understand what, 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 what methods work and what, what methods don't work. So in 2016, two new case studies came into the scene, Pingala and the Lismore model that we'll be hearing about tonight. Um, and these two um, projects took it off their own bat to create their own case studies to be inserted into an, an anticipated update of the guide. And at the same time, um, Brendan Lim, the illustrator who created the decision tree, which is now on the back page of the guide, um, also updated that and, and he generously did, donated his time for that. Um, and then at the Congress in February of 2017, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a growing awareness that people weren't, 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 weren't aware of the guide. Um, and as part of an initiative to make sure that we were capturing the, the momentum from the Congress, um, we actually decided that it would be a good idea to relaunch the guide, not just relaunch it, but to relaunch it with a, with a decent promotion um, plan, and that's what these webinars are part of, as well as um, doing training and so forth. So we're really um, uh, fortunate that Sustainability Victoria have funded this guide. Um, it's now a standalone document. It's not been lost in the noise of a bigger release. Um, uh, the lead author was, was Community Power Agency, acting in our capacity as the Secretariat of the Coalition for Community Energy. And yet again, we have collabor uh, it's a deeply collaborative project. Uh, most of the case studies updated their existing case studies, updated their case studies, and then we have five new case studies in the guide. Um, and uh, you know, we're pretty pleased with the result. Um, and I'm now going to play a short video from the sponsor, Sustainability Victoria. So here we go. Let's have a Good evening, everyone. My name is Carl Muller. I'm the interim CEO of Sustainability Victoria. Welcome to the small scale solar guide webinar series taking place each Tuesday throughout the course of September. At Sustainability Victoria, we're passionate about making a sustainable and thriving Victoria mobilising us all to create a better environment now and for our future. We're proud to have supported the Community Power Agency bringing you this webinar series and the latest edition of the Community Solar Guide. Over the four webinars, we'll get to hear some really innovative ideas for behind the meter investment and some great legal frameworks. I hope you enjoy the series. So, yep, yeah, thank you, Carl, and Sustainability Victoria. Um, we couldn't have done it without you, and, and the support means a lot. So before we get started, um, the guide has been released. You can find it on the C4C website. You will have 
seen it in, in links to in the emails that you received today. Um, but please be aware that we're open for feedback. So if you see any mistakes, um, you have any suggestions, or want, perhaps you've got to want to make, it, make a more substantial contribution, this has already always been a collaborative effort. So please send an email to that email address, secretariat at c4ce.net.au, and, and let us know what you think. Um, we'll be releasing version 2.1 um, in October. So that'll be great. So tonight, we're going to be talking about the investment models um, that, 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 that sit in the guide. Um, so just a reminder that the original version of this guide set out a range of different typologies of community energy. And those typologies were updated in the uh, uh, Guide to Community Energy for Victorians, which the Victorian government published last year. Um, and so these models are all community investment models, the, the, the models that are, that are showcased in the guide. Um, some of them fall into other categories as well. Um, and quite obviously, what these investment models refer to is the fact that um, members of the community have provided funds to pay for a project to happen on the expectation that they'll get their money back and probably with some sort of um, interest to reward them for providing their money over a period of time. So why, why are investment projects so important? Well, actually, they're actually, they're, they're actually really popular. And I think that really tells us why they're so important. People are really motivated to put their money where their mouth is and um, take action by investing in their local community. And I think there's a widely held and logical belief that it's easier to raise funds if people are investing money rather than if you're going out there and asking people to simply donate their money. Um, many people are inspired by the idea of community-owned renewable energy, and clearly when we have investments sitting behind it, it falls under that sort of sub-component of what community energy might be, which is, which is community-owned renewable energy. Um, so we see m the majority of the models that are, that are up and running at the moment are investment-based um, models, and the majority of the community solar groups doing small-scale projects are considering doing investment projects. So this is a really important part of the guide. Um, so in the introduction to the guide, we talk about um, the challenges that are causing this, um, <laughs> the majority of the projects to be doing small scale or behind the meter below the load. Um, but we also talk about the really important consideration of if you're raising investment funds um, from members of the community that this is actually highly regulated, um, a highly regulated space. So doing an investment-based community solar project, project means that you're sitting at the junction of two highly regulated industries, the, 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 the energy industry and the, and the investment industry. Um, and the reason why these investments are regulated is to protect everyday people from ill-conceived or unscrupulous investments. And so there's a range of protections to protect us from un unscrupulous operators. Um, and really, if you want to, want to raise investments from regular people, what are known as retail investors, then you're probably gonna need to comply with a bunch of regulations. You, you'll, ne you'll need to have some sort of lodged um, offer information statement, you, commonly known as a prospectus, um, and that's quite an expensive process. Um, you're probably going to need to take substantial annual reporting, maybe get audited each year, and under some circumstances, you might even need what's known as, a, as an Australian Financial Services Licence. Now, there's nothing wrong with all of those things, except that they're really for larger projects where there's perhaps thousands of, of investors being exposed. And what happens in community energy is they tend to be smaller scale. So there's several ways around these regulations. Um, one is to sort of embrace them um, and to uh, comply with all of these requirements. And that's, that's really what um, the Sydney Renewable Power Company project has, has attempted to do. And they're pushing the threshold of 
whether or not they are small scale anymore. Um, but what's far more common, because it's aligned with all the reasons why we do small scale um, behind the meter, behind the load, is for um, groups to take advantage of what's known as the small scale offerings, or more widely known as the 20, 2012 two rule. And what these exemptions say, and it's a range of exemptions across the Corporations Act, what these exemptions say is that if you're offering your investment to less than 20 investors in a 12 month period, and it's less than $2 million that you're raising, then there's a whole range of provisions that you don't need to comply with. Um, there's still restrictions, but it's a lot less, it's a lot less onerous. And this is really designed so that small businesses can raise funds from family and friends. Um, and, and it's perfectly suited to small scale uh, raisings within communities. Um, I should mention that the third way of avoiding these um, highly regulated processes is to um, look at becoming a cooperative. Um, and that's what Pingala's done and, and there'll probably be other community groups joining that model soon as well. So, um, no, we're not looking for questions at the moment. Uh, we're gonna pass over to Kylie just now, um, who's gonna give us a bit of a run through of the Clear Sky model. So Kylie, we might get you to start by sharing your screen. Um, and then briefly introducing who you are. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, just sharing my screen now and going to my PowerPoint. Uh oh. Um, <clears throat> Looks good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, just You'll get from the beginning. Yep. Hmm. Doesn't seem to want to go back to the beginning. I'll just have to manually pop it up there. Here we go. And big screen. What happens if you click on that control resume slideshow, Carly? It just got stuck. All right, let's try now. From beginning. Slideshow, resume slideshow. Ah, here we go. All right, can everybody see that? Yep, looks really good. Good, okay. So, hello everyone, I'm Kylie Hitchman. I'm one of the directors of Clear Sky Solar, and we are a non for profit um, public company which is unlicensed. We're run by volunteers and we um, are a community group. So, uh, I want to um, tell you about our model, how we started up. Um, we came out of a community, a local community group that was part of um, Clean Energy for Eternity, which was a group that started off on the south coast of New South Wales, and then they started up branches um, around New South Wales. And we're from the Northern Beaches um, branch. And in 2013, we actually got a grant, we applied for a grant, from the Office of Environment and Heritage to start up Clear Sky Solar Investments because our aim was to reduce greenhouse gases, get renewable energy up as quickly as possible, and we came up with this model to do so. So we got our grant, which set up our administration, a model to run, and we started making it work. And that was four years ago on September 2013, so we're celebrating our fourth anniversary. And our main aim is linking community investors to high quality solar projects, where the site owners of the solar projects, for whatever reason, um, don't have the funds to put their own solar panels up or choose to use a community group to do so. And that's where the investors come in. So it's a really simple model on the surface of it. The investors um, band together to form a trust and they invest directly in the solar panels. They actually, in our model, um, create a loan to our solar um, installer, which buys the panels with their money, installs them and maintains them. Then the site owner will be buying the electricity off uh, the solar company, 
which in our case, we're using just one at the moment called um, Smart Commercial Solar. And the revenue from the electricity generated from the sun goes back to the investors. They get their capital back and also they get a, um, they get a revenue back, which is interest on their capital. So this is sort of breaking down how we've set up the model with legal contracts that we um, have devised and got legally certificates that we can actually share with other groups. Um, over there is the trust, which is a group of people. Now, most of our um, projects are under 100 kilowatts, so they can get the um, small scale technology certificates from the renewable um, from the RET, Renewable Energy Target Scheme. That means that we'll get um, a bit of money up front from those certificates to set up the project. And um, we also, because we're small scale and we're also forming a trust without, as, as Tom said, the Australian um, license, um, financial services license, we didn't want to invest in that, so we stay under 20 people in our trusts. So we gather together people in the community that's usually connected to the host site or in the locality of the host site, so it's a community thing, up to 20 people together, or some of those 20 might have their own um, small-scale family superannuation trust, so it might be a, you know, a family group or something, so there might be technically more than 20, but really 20 investors form a trust. They then, um, we form a trustee company, which is a special purpose vehicle. That's a sort of an, an entity that um, gets created. And that's the entity that connect, that relates to the other stakeholders. Down here on the left-hand side, we've got ourselves, the agent with Clear Sky Solar, we're like just the administration, we're the broker, we're the facilitator. We actually um, don't have direct contracts with the uh, host sites because those direct contacts go through our service provider, which in our case is a solar installing company called Smart Commercial Solar. So the, there are an agreements of an operations agreements between the administration Clear Sky Solar and the trust. And then there's an investment agreement between the trust and the service provider, Clear Sky um, Smart Commercial Solar. And then Smart Commercial Solar directly sets up a contract with contracts with the customer, the site owner, the building where the panels are being installed. And the main one is a power purchase agreement. So that's a supply agreement. And then there's also operations and management agreements because throughout the period of the trust, which lasts between seven to 10 years, Smart Commercial Solar will actually own the panels, maintain the panels and collect revenue from the panels. They'll send the money then back to Clear Sky Solar and we will distribute it back to the trusts and the trustees. So um, hopefully that's not too complicated. Uh, onto the next slide. So we Carly, here, um, Carly I might, I might yeah, just too fast. No, no, you're, you're absolutely fine. I might just jump in there and just yep. make it very clear to everybody that we will be pausing for questions and answers after each one of these presentations from Kylie and Adam. Um, so feel free to start putting your questions in the Q and A panel if you're if you're an attendee. Sorry to interrupt you there, Carly. That's okay. I know that. Um, well, if people have um, read your new uh, things, they would have seen models, and most of you would have the idea anyway. Yep. So this is how far we've got in the last four years. We have 14 trusts set up that cover 17 projects. Most of these, like there's 14 trusts, and then there's um, about five other projects which are sole investors. They're some of the small ones, and we cover at the moment Queensland, New South Wales, and Western Australia. Um, we have interest from Tasmania and Victoria and South Australia as well. It, um, 
yes, so we've been scanning the whole country. So at the moment, um, we have people who are registered to be investors. The first investors we get are from the community close to the site, and then we get new investors. And then we, um, if we haven't got enough for a trust, we'll call on our other investors. We have um, 11, no, uh, we have 1,150, so 1,150 people registered to be investors. The reason why we have them like that is that we can't actually advertise, um, it's one of the regulations, we can't advertise that a project is coming up. People have to get registered first and then when the site comes up, they, would, they can bid for an investment. I'll, I can talk about more of that later. So, um, we have 1.5 megawatts of energy um, being generated from our sites. It's saving um, around uh, 1,600 tonnes of CO2. Emissions have been avoided and the total investment at the moment is um, over $2 million. So, um, so, we're always looking for good host sites. Um, we are fortunate that Smart Commercial Solar, our partner, does actually travel around Australia and suggests to some of the sites that they might like a power purchase agreement to get the solar panels up. But we also have had a lot of host sites from communities, like um, we've got the Bellingen Buttery um, Arts sort of factory who, who have got together locals and they've put in a DA that they're going to put solar panels up. So communities have also applied and also just individuals saying, look, I've got a factory here or I've got um, a warehouse there, can we be your host site? So they come from all places. But we're ideally looking for, you know, a sunny roof that's owned by the business. So it's not being leased or rented. And there's long-term perspective and continuity. You know, we don't want something where it's going, business is going to fail, it's going to change hands. We need security from up to seven years and in some cases 10 years because that's how long the trust will last to pay off the panels. And that there's high, day, high daytime energy consumption. So we don't want somebody who's just going to be using all electricity at night because we want them to use the power generated from the sun directly to their business because that's where it's going to make the difference. And um, yeah, moderate energy consumption between 30 kilowatts and 100 kilowatts. And continuous consumption seven days per week all year. The reason for this, um, and that all power generators consumed on site, you know, back like when I got my solar panels on, I could get 60 cents um, kilo per kilowatt hour on my generation and that was a good deal, but now it's, it's way down. And so businesses can only um, work on getting cheap electricity from the sun if they use all the energy that's being generated from the sun in their business. And if they're working during the evening, then they'll be having their um, prior energy electricity um, generate, or, um, like, you know, AGL or Origin or whoever they had before, hopefully they're going to be using renewable energy for their evening things or some of them will close down. So yeah, ideally something that's open during the day and maybe turns off the lights at night will make a good deal with us. So this, this just explains with a graph what I just said. Um, what we want is to scale the system daily to demand all the power generated is consumed. So this is like behind the meter. So in a top grid, we've got the solar generated in blue, and then if there's more energy needed, um, the grid can just top it up. What we don't want is the bottom grid, where we've got more um, energy generated than is being used, because that energy is just being lost, but we will still be charging the site owner for the generation of that electricity. So that's not going to be economically viable for them. Because we actually, when we make a contract with them on the PPA, we set the price for the next seven to 10 years based on forecasts of 
energy demand and um, our guesstimate of what the, the price is going to do. So this is going to make it good for them. The host site actually wins because they will be paying less for their power than they were previously paying. Um, and we work that out for them as well, that that's the deal. So they win, the investor wins, and of course the environment wins. So, um, Tom, can I ask you to just check my time for me because I was going to monitor my own time. You tell me when to sort of wind it up, okay? Well, okay? I think we're probably going to ask a few questions. So maybe do, do wind it up fairly soon. Oh, okay. Yep. I'll just zoom through these then. Yep. Um, this is just uh, an example of one of our sites. It's a 50 kilowatt system at um, RSPCA. And it was for a 10, 10 year term and it cost $60,000 to put on the solar panels. Um, and it was subscribed subscribed for in three hours. That meant when we told our investors, do you want to invest in this? Within three hours, everybody had invested. And this is how the trust works. Um, even though it cost $60,000 um, and there's say up to 20, people investing in the trust, not everybody has to pay the same amount. One person could pay, you know, half the amount and others can pay small amounts. I'm just going to zoom through these. One thing I wanted to point out, this is um, what below the load means. When we put on the panels, we work out on estimate how much energy is going to be needed. And then we finally tune that to how many panels are needed. Because panels cost money, of course. You don't want extra panels when that energy is not going to be used. We encourage all our sites to become energy efficient, put in, you know, the proper lighting and things before we put the panels on. Because if they're using a lot of electricity and then they get energy efficient after the panels on, again, that will be, um, be wasted. Um, zooming through, at the end of the seven to ten year trust, the site owners get free panels. They get to own the panels themselves and run them themselves. They can have that gift for you know another 10 to 20 years because that's how long panels can work up to 30 years. And I'll just, um, so everything is maintained by Clear Sky Solar, by Smart Commercial Solar. Um, there are there is a bit of risks for the investor, like they can't just rip their money back like you can in a bank. And, um, but we're trying to make it as risk-free as, as possible. Sometimes the actual site um, doesn't work for many reasons like blackouts and stuff, but we usually back up those risks and spread them out across the board. And for the site owner, there is a risk that the power price will drop that, um, compared to their original contract where they're fixed in. Um, I just want to show you this slide before I finish and I won't go into detail. What we do at Clear Sky, um, Clear Sky Solar Investments, we do the administration, we do behind the scenes admin that makes this all happen. And that's a voluntary role and we do it at cost. And these are some of the things we do. So there's actually just four of us, but to be honest, um, uh, one or two of us do it at a time, basically one person at the moment, and we all support each other in many different ways. It's a lot of work, and we have got um, looking for another grant to get this all automated, and we're halfway there. So what I'd like to say at the end is that if you do have a project and you want to use our model, we can have this admin system work for you. You find that your site, you find your community, and then you can pass your model through us, through your site and community investments through us, and we can make it happen using our admin and legal um, legal agreements have already been set up. Okay, thanks, Tom. Great. Um, well, I'll ask. I'll start with some questions that have come from the participants. Gavin has said. Uh, we're going back to finding host sites. I've heard the biggest problem with the investment model is not finding in, in investors, but finding host sites. Why is it so hard and what advice can you give Kylie to make it easier for new community energy groups? Is there some kind of checklist we might use? Well, I'll just go back to the checklist here. There's, there's a, a few different things. First of all, we do need a criteria, like a lot of our projects 
are in very sunny places where the electricity cost is high. So they're country, rural, inland, where because they're at the end of the grid, they often have quite expensive electricity. And then we can make it cheaper for them. They also have sun and less rainy days over the other side of the mountains or inland Australia. So what so you're saying, Kylie, is that this is very compelling for these, for these customers. Yes. Yeah. So they will jump at it. But yeah. we have also done more coastal sites in Sydney and and the benefit of that is they might get for the investors a lower rate of return, but it's still up around six to seven percent um, on their their capital. It's quite a good return when you compare that to a bank. Um, and those host sites are doing it for community-minded ways. They've got a community behind them. They want to be seen as environmentally conscious, and um, so and they also may not have the the money up front to put on solar panels. What we have found, Tom and Gavin, is often we'll be approaching sites and we'll be talking about solar, solar panels and, and we can offer a, a power purchase agreement. And often people go, well, you know what? I'm going to just do it myself. Um, maybe they do find the money. And we see that as a win as well because the main aim is actually to get more solar panels up there. And whether they do it through us or do it themselves, we are still achieving that, that that site has got its solar panels on it, even though they're not going through us. So that's that's a win. But right. it is true. We do have more investors than we have sites, and maybe yeah. some of our investors might be getting a bit edgy because they're dying to get um, their investments in, but we haven't got as many sites to, to meet them straight away. But what we do with that is um, we are stopping people double-dipping um, some people early days invested in two or three trusts. Now we've got so many investors that new, first of all, community, local community people get first choice to the investment, be part of the trust, and then new investors get a first chance. So eventually all the new investors, because we're getting more and more projects, we are, they are coming in, will get a chance to be in a trust. Great. So Kylie, I've got a couple of rapid fire questions. Are your projects getting bigger? Uh, yes, actually, I did say that most of our projects are less than 100 kilowatts, but we are taking on some bigger ones. We have got one just recently, Blackwoods, which is 450 kilowatts, and so therefore it's not getting the small-scale technology certificate. We've gone into the large-scale large, um, large scale generation certificates with that one. Interesting. And I also sense they're getting more frequent as well. Well, yes, it's, it's true. I think because... Um, you know, the words out there of how the power purchase agreement can work for sites that, yeah, they are coming up more frequent. Like, you know, yeah, the first year I think we might have had a few and then each year it is accelerating. Yep, yep, fantastic. And, and one of the things I really like about what you've, what you've done and it's, it's the unique characteristic of your model is that you're, you're partnering very closely with Smart Commercial Solar and they're the ones that are actually doing most of the hard yards around solar sales? We are so lucky having such a good partnership. And if anybody out there wants to start from scratch or use their own local solar company, there's, we do have some recommendations of how to choose a good one to be a good partnership. Great. Um, but as I said before, Smart Commercial Solar can also come in and install on your community site. Fine. Yes, it's, it's made our level of risk and our trust has gone up because we've been working with them for so long and um, we're a good team. Yeah, and I really love the way you're mixing investments of different sizes. What, what's the smallest investment that you can't, can sort of practically accept? We can go down to just 15 um, kilowatts. It's, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I meant in terms of uh, an individual investor. What's the smallest oh. investment you can accept from an individual investor? Oh, I see. Well, that depends because... Um, so the average cost of solar panel installation is around $80,000. Yep. And then divide that for 20, by 20, that's like, oh, I'm terrible with maths, that's 4,000. Um, but let's say $60,000 would be 3,000. So it all depends on how much um, the cost of the site is. So, however, that would be on average. Let's yep. say we have a trust where 
three people want to take most of the load and they might want to throw in $10,000, then we can go down to, say, $2,000 for invest. But we don't go below that because we have to do administration for them every quarter when we pay them out. And if their investment is small, it's it's maybe not worthwhile for them or for us doing that. 2000 is very low. Um, you know, Pingala, we went to 250, but it was, a, it was an experiment and we don't believe that's sustainable. It's just too low. So yeah. 2000 is probably, probably we, about. We have gone down to, to 1000 as well and even yeah. 500, but that's in early days. And now we're getting the projects up and we realize that um, we can end up with a shortfall. Our main challenge is when, when the, we found the site, we um, know how much everything's going to cost. We need the investors to bring their money on in a very quick turnover of, yeah. of a few weeks so that smart commercial solar will be able to buy the panels and go with it. Yeah. So therefore, mucking around um, with very small investments and, and having a shortfall that might have to be um, underwritten by one of the investors or even smart commercial solar is, is not what we're encouraging. Great. Okay, one more question from the par from the participants. Um, Mark says, "What's the legal status of Clear Sky Solar Investments itself, and who controls the trustee company?" So, two questions there. We'll get you to run through that very quickly, Carly. Okay. Yeah. So, we've made it as risk-free for us as possible. We've got four directors, and everything's quite legal. So, um, who we will. With the operations agreement, the operations agreement is between the investors who formed a trust and us. And when the trust is set up, it needs each trust will need a director and a something else. And so that's one of us as directors who will be signing it off on the trust. So um, each trust is set up like a little company in itself. The reason why we have to do this is to fit within the legal guidelines to make it as financially efficient for, for everybody, including us, so, so we don't pay out money. Yeah. Did that answer the question? There's two questions. What was that? Uh, well, the first question was the legal status of Clear Sky Solar yeah. Investments itself. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, we are a public company. We yeah. are unlisted public company, and we're a non-for-profit um, yeah, community organisation. And so we've got proprietary limited. So we're registered, yeah, that way. Great. Okay. And uh, so I suppose, you know, because all the risk mainly goes to Smart Commercial Solar, our installer, with all the financial things, because they've got the agreements. If things fall down, they're going to carry the financial weight. We're not going to be losing our mortgages and houses um, in that case. Mm -hmm only if maybe our deal with them goes down that we'd be at risk but we're very trusting and have good faith there great um kylie thank you very much for that we do need to move on um really appreciate your time and your insights would you be able to hang, hang around and perhaps answer some questions live if any people have some lingering questions i noticed that yes, there's a question right. from carol there that you might be able to to help her with yeah no worries thank you all right, well, we're going to pass over to Adam Blakester now. Adam is, or um, well, you better better to introduce yourself, Adam, um, but Adam's going to talk to us about the, um, the Lismore Community Solar Farm model. So we'll get you to take control of the screen if you can, Adam. Great, looks good. Okay, can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Excellent. And you've only got 10 minutes. Uh, thanks. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm going to be <laughs> swift. So <laughs> thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you to Community Power Agency and the Coalition for Community Energy for uh, arranging uh, the webinar series, the opportunity to participate, and also for the update to the guide. I think it's a pivotally important tool uh, for, for our fledgling sector and movement, Starfish uh, whom I'm executive director of, has provided training and support for several dozen community energy groups and startups now. And invariably, we find that they're re running the risk of reinventing wheels, trying to develop models uh, in, in niches that 
many of us have already investigated and uh, at the same time are skipping over the existing models and the opportunity to just utilize what's already on the shelf. So the guide's great, great for that. So I'm talking about the Lismore Community Solar Farms uh, and what is a loan based model, quite different to the Clear Sky and, and the other models uh, that are available in this space. So let me dive into that. Uh, let's make sure the, oh, hello. Uh, yeah, so these are projects of uh, a collaboration that we call Farming the Sun. Farming the Sun, in our view, is the most diverse community solar initiative in Australia so far. And we say that because Farming the Sun has worked across so many different solar technologies and worked across so many different models of developing community solar projects. To this point, we've just passed, uh, about a month ago, we passed the 1.5 megawatt mark of installation. So very similar to Clear Sky. We're about eight years in the running though. So congrats to Clear Sky on how swiftly and successfully their model uh, has proven itself. Um, we've installed uh, solar PV on homes, businesses, farms. We've also coordinated solar hot water, bulk buys, and solar thermal heating and cooling systems. And of course, the two community solar farms that I'm talking about tonight as well. Farming the Sun is an initiative of Starfish. So Starfish is the charity that sits behind this. As I said, I'm executive director of that. Like Clear Sky, we are a unlisted public company, uh, which is, in my view, the premium uh, and most uh, effective legal structure for, for charities because it's national uh, and because it's got well-proven support in terms of accounting, governance and the like. Starfish's mission is to create and support the essential changes required to achieve genuine rural and regional sustainability. In our view, we're one of only two organisations on earth that specialise in this area, uh, which is deeply concerning for us. Uh, the whole rural and regional space, much like Australia, if you've ever seen a map of where Australia lives, uh, there's a couple of big blue blobs in the obvious places around the metropolitan centres, and then there's just this vast nothingness. Uh, two years ago was the first time in human history that more people lived in cities than in rural and remote areas around the world. So this is a really key area uh, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of energy generation, food production and the like, uh, hence our passion for it. Uh, the other significance of our work is that we do work holistically on sustainability, uh, areas like social housing, uh, farming, soil restoration, um, Energy is about 15% uh, of, our, of our work program. So diving into the Lismore models, I'd like to acknowledge the major funders and pro bono partners. They're on screen with you. Um, there's a bit of a backstory, which I won't go into a lot of detail about, but suffice to say, when we originally started working on community owned and operated solar, we were looking at an owned and operated model, uh, and we were looking at the potential of developing a couple of dozen of these projects in the Northern Rivers and the New England regions of New South Wales. Um, then the political risks hit. Uh, that was the biggest headwind that we faced. And that led us to not have confidence that we could build projects larger than 100 kilowatts because of the risk with the large scale uh, renewable energy certificates. And once we contracted back to sub 100 kilowatts, we had to completely change the model. And so these funders and partners stuck through us through uh, what was a hideous journey really, because we had to change direction so many times. Tom has mentioned this already, but I'd like to reiterate it. The decision guide that was developed, uh, Brendan Lim's very cute graphics, which were developed for the Zero Net Energy Town project that we did actually and it's nice to see them used in more and other ways. And importantly, so second from the bottom, uh, nothing to do with order of importance, I'm sure, Kylie, so you're there 
<laughs> at the very bottom, and then there's the farming, the sun, the Lismore models. But really important for you to look at these models in the context of what you're trying to achieve in terms of a community solar project and where the other models that are listed there sit relative to the Lismore model I'm talking about tonight. So in simple terms, the Lismore model uh, is to develop 100 kilowatt solar farms, in fact, two of them. Each project has a community company established to manage the investment. They're both proprietary limited companies, very common form of company. Uh, there's a maximum of 20 sh shareholders for each of them, for the reasons Tom's already mentioned, uh, that uh, the, the um, investment raising rules constrain to no more than 20 in a year, and we didn't want to run an in, uh, a fundraising or capital raising process that took longer than a year, we just wanted to do it in one hit. Um, each of those companies raised the money, uh, and then there was a loan between them and Lismore City Council. Lismore City Council then repays that loan, plus interest, it's a flat interest rate for the period of the arrangement, seven years, and because that money's flowing through a company, the companies then pay uh, a fully frank dividend back to the investors or the shareholders. And of course, council uh, with a loan, they are then the owner operator of the solar farms and receive the benefits in terms of renewable energy, electricity savings. And in the case of these projects, an enormous amount of community engagement and publicity uh, we never anticipated how much publicity, and I think initially that was because this was so novel uh, in terms of partnering with councils. I think a lot of us look to our local councils to partner with on community energy and a range of other sustainability areas, but they're notoriously difficult to partner with. And so I think the novelty of what we were doing was of interest. Uh, the other thing that gave it a kick along was, uh, and that's just a, a mock up in the top left, uh, but the floating solar farm, which is about to be installed in the next month, will be the largest floating installation yet done in Australia. And so again, novelty uh, has attracted a whole lot of interest. Um, these, these projects don't come out of the blue. I haven't talked much about that in the presentation, but Lismore is a region you may or may not know is not too far from a place called Nimbin, which very much was the birth place of the hippie movement in Australia in the 60s. And there's very deep, sustained engagement with ecological and sustainable issues, sustainability issues in that region. Lismore City Council itself was the first regional council in Australia to commit to 100% renewable energy for its own operations. In fact, they made that commitment on the same day that we publicly announced they were signing on to a MOU to do these two solar farms. So it went hand in hand with this work. It, it basically inspired them to take that leadership. Um, and then more recently, uh, the, the Bentley blockades and the Lock the Gate movement and its epicenter there in getting Met Gas gone and uh, the first time in Australian history where a gas company has been forced uh, and paid out by the state government to leave their exploration and operation license, all of this is happening within kilometres of uh, the sites that we're talking about. So a very strong social licence for renewable energy. So this is a visual depiction of what I just said. Uh, we've got the, share, the shareholders, if you go down the right side, uh, they subscribe for shares into the company, uh, the two companies, one of which is called uh, the Ganelabar Company, which is the site of the solar farm on the sports and aquatic centre. They lend the money to council, that constructs uh, the, the solar farm. And then out of the energy savings, council then replays uh, the interest. It's an interest only loan for a period of seven years. And then the capital is repaid at the end of that seven year period. And, and that money goes to the company, the community company, and in turn back to the shareholders. This simple comparison um, of what a loan based model is like, so the middle column to a power sale. So Kylie talked about a power purchase agreement uh, structure that's being used by ClearSky. So to Repower, who you may be familiar with out of the Shoalhaven as opposed to the two other 
repower branded branded campaigns running around Australia now. Uh, use power purchase based arrangements. Um, our, our view in the end was that because we were setting up these two companies, both of which need uh, some of the investors to voluntarily be directors and handle the governance and finance and administration obligations of the companies, much like what Kylie was talking about, we wanted to develop a model that had the minimum obligations in terms of governance and administration. And with a loan, it is a set and forget arrangement. And you'll see that in some of the tables coming up. Whereas power purchase arrangements do need to be, do need to be monitored. Uh, they also have risk, performance risk in terms of the solar power system. We didn't want that risk sitting on the investor side of this arrangement. Again, why? Because they're small and the effort required we wanted to keep to a minimum. So the overall conclusion in our view is the model we've developed is incredibly simple and very low complexity, uh, which we were of the view was key. Uh, there's a couple of excerpts now from the prospectus or investment offer. Uh, so in terms of what are the benefits for an investor and much like Clear Sky and others in this space, we had no problem in the end with investors. In fact, we were oversubscribed in a couple of weeks. We were oversubscribed to the point where we could have funded a third solar farm uh, in its entirety. Uh, so that, that surplus subscription was returned to investors and we had no difficulty fully subscribing the two projects. Um, as I've already said, the next dot point there around key risk borne by council because they own and operate the solar farm. And because it's a loan with them, there is of course some financial risk in lending money to another party. But in the case of Lismore City, uh, it's got a balance sheet, uh, net assets from memory about a hundred million dollars and it's trading at a surplus. It's a very secure uh, and well-run council in our view. Um, and then the investor returns, which are underpinned by this fixed interest rate loan, which makes it very predictable. So there's a little bit more detail here about the investment. One, one of the constraints, and Tom touched on this, because we could have no more than 20 investors, uh, and when we originally established uh, these projects, which was many, many years before the solar farms were actually built, um, we were looking at $180,000 for each of the solar farms. In the end, they didn't cost anything like that. Um, the loan agreement was altered to accommodate the lower cost of the solar technology and allow for Lismore City Council to invest any surplus funds into uh, energy efficiency measures, which is what they've done. So in the end, these loans were structured to fund solar farms plus energy efficiency upgrades to lighting and pumping uh, and ventilation systems. But the constraint uh, that I was mentioning is that we had to raise that amount of money from no more than 20 shareholders, which meant the minimum investment was $9,000 for, for one shareholder. And of course, for, for many people, that was too much money. Uh, we were totally sensitive to that, but constrained by the legalities of what we could do. Um, and then in terms of investor returns, so the third paragraph down is probably the key one. The target financial return is a fully frank dividend of 3.7% per annum over the seven year life. And then depending on the individual investor's circumstances will affect how much of an additional benefit they gain from that dividend stream being fully franked. So someone who's on uh, the highest marginal tax rate will gain the most advantage from that. Someone who's not paying tax at all will gain no benefit from it whatsoever. From the franking you mean specifically? From, from the franking credit specifically. So the 3.7% is the cash yeah. return discounted back over the seven year period, just using net present value calculations. Um, but the franking credits is their ability to claim those franking credits back off tax that they're otherwise paying. Um, and here's the financial model. So as you can see, there's very little in it. So top line, $180,000 lent. The interest rate with council, 5.5%. Um, the interest income calculated annually, 
And then you've got the operating costs of the community companies, which comprise uh, an annual lodgement fee to ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Commission, which all companies, uh, for-profit companies, need to lodge. Uh, that's a very simple uh, return to fill in, and there's a, a lodgement fee that goes with it. And then we've allowed for some bank fees, though so far we don't even have them. Um, so that's earnings before tax for the company, uh, and then the companies, because they're proprietary limited, they're not charitable structures, they need to pay company tax, but that company tax is then passed through to the shareholders in the form of franking credits on the dividends. And that is the whole financial model. It's, it's very, very simple. And then this is, um, you know, obviously very small, but uh, in terms of font size, but just to get it on a screen, what, what this does is show you for a, um, for the, in terms of the cash flow, of the uh, original loan interest payments there in that first column is the interest paid by Lismore City Council. As I said, it's an interest only loan for the seven year period. So they make quarterly instalments and then the capital is repaid in full at the end of the seven years, which is at the very bottom of the first co column, the capital column. Um, and then the operating expenses of the company, the profit, the tax, and then the dividend. So you can see that it's all very small numbers over at the right hand side, but that, that is what a $9,000 uh, share gets each investor by year, plus franking credits over the period of the seven year investment. And then lastly, you know, what were the major milestones and so too, what are the documents and agreements that we have that we can share under a Creative Commons license with any of you that might be interested? Um, so originally we had a strategic plan, of course, um, and the pro that, that plan and the, the Gantt that went with it. Um, we had partner agreements, uh, which included proposals and memorandums of understanding. That was with solar partners, uh, also with legal firms. Uh, we developed a whole lot of communication materials. Similar to Clear Sky, we went through the whole host site recruitment and there was a campaign. Uh, it may um, interest you, may also terrify you, it certainly does me. We assessed over 120 prospective sites. These are the only two that proceeded. Um, many of them proceeded independently like Clear Sky. Once they looked at the numbers, realized that it was much better financially for them to do it themselves. Uh, and so the concept of community very quickly transformed to be nothing more than a finance provider and the bigger picture of engagement, education and leadership, et cetera, just disappeared. Um, we then went through site feasibility assessments, financially modeling the sites that proceeded past that. We then entered a heads of agreement. That was Lismore and, and, and several others, but Lismore were the only two to go through to fruition. Um, then like Clear Sky, we had to legally um, create subscribers who expressed interest in a potential investment, but they were not able to know what the details of that investment were yet. Um, and then once we'd formed the companies, we were able to develop the share offer or the prospectus, which was then shared with those subscribers who'd already indicated interest. So they had to be a private group. Um, the loan agreement was struck and then to do with council. And then lastly, council as the owner operator of the solar farms manage the procurement uh, and tender process. And that, doc that documentation is publicly available via, via them. So that's the model. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your interest and any and all questions, most welcome. I'm gonna ask some questions and people get your questions through. Um, question I have is, you mentioned novelty in the context of the council. So doing something for the first time and Lismore Council being, um, uh, having a track record of doing, doing cutting stuff. Does novelty always help with councils, do you think? Oh, look, I, I mentioned the novelty more that it helped with promotion and profile and, and, and PR and the like. Yeah. Um, Lismore City Council weren't, um, you know, interested because it was novel. They, in addition to launching their 100% renewable energy target, which was the general manager's big, hairy, audacious goal 
that was launched on the same day they signed an MOU with us. Um, they also had a community partnership strategy and still do. And they're very significant things because most large organisations, councils included, are very inward focused and operate in silos. Uh, and council, Lismore City Council had realised probably a decade ago, if they were to pursue sustainability in a genuine sense, they couldn't do it alone and they needed to work with other third parties and they needed to work with them in a very effective, open and trusting way. And so their partnership strategy, as well as their renewable energy target is what, what meant Liz, uh, the Farming the Sun proposal was a strategic fit for them. Um, yes, there was then marketing value in this being a first in Australia, but it, that wasn't um, a criteria for them. Okay, great. And where that question comes from is I've, I've heard councils say, oh, we don't want to be first. Like, the, the, I, think, I think there's different profiles of, yeah, risk, risk averseness. And, and there were plenty of people in council, including some senior executives, yeah. who openly talked about the leading edge as the bleeding edge. <laughs> we should so stand back and let someone else pioneer this and then come in, slipstream them. Great. Uh, well, ultimately... <laughs> We had sufficient, um, you know, votes on council. This, these projects went to council for vote, I think, eight times uh, from go to woe. Uh, painful, absolutely painful. Great, but the point now for everyone else is that this has been done, it's been proven, and, and, and councils don't need to be so, uh, so, so worried about this. It's, it's, it's proven. Well. Indeed, yeah. yeah. It's been de-risked. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, can you explain why you chose to do a capital only, an interest only loan? Interest only loan. Uh, yes, because if principal was repaid on a quarterly basis as well, the return on investment reduces to a level that we didn't think would be sufficiently appealing to the investors. Sure. So it's actually like a defer, it's, it's like a deferred payment scheme for the council. Yeah, I mean, an interest-only loan is, is one way of doing it. They ran their their own internal rate of return calculations on these projects. Um, and just to reiterate, because the value proposition for them was much broader than just community finance, yeah. they have a genuine appreciation and it sits in their strategic plan of the value in partnering with community uh, of developing up novel ways of working in collaboration with key stakeholders and all, all of this fit with their renewable energy master plan and their partnering strategy. So yeah. that gave them latitude to, to put a business case to council that was broader than just purely financial. And um, if, if you're working with a council that is only interested in the financial metrics, my, my advice would be get out of there now. Yep. Absolutely. And I think we've got some, some other stories from elsewhere in the community energy sector that would back that up. All right. Well, mm. um, we're past seven o'clock and I, I keep an eye on the number of attendees at this point and they've started dropping off. So we'll ask the last question and we'll bring this to an end. Um, how open source is this and how difficult would it be for other groups to adopt this, this model, um, Adam? Uh, send, send me an email. Um, I get requests on average probably uh, two, two or three a month. Um, the, the key thing that I'm asking people is assessing what they're looking to use it for. Uh, there is time involved on my part, totally voluntary. This has been unfunded work for years now. Uh, and so I do some due diligence uh, before going to the trouble of packaging it all up because if it's just someone who's tire kicking, I've got better things to do with my time. Um, but if if there is a genuine fit, uh, and there's examples I can give, like uh, Bendigo Sustainability Group, where we've corresponded and provided all of that documentation and talked them through what it is and how it all fits together, uh, and you know, very very open to anyone who's genuinely interested to make contact with us. Yep. But this has all been developed under a Creative Commons licensing arrangement, is that correct? Uh, yes, it has. The, the one exception to that is the loan agreement, which we can share confidentially, but it can't be utilised just yet. That's a Norton Rose Fulbright, uh, the law firm who developed that. But we're working as part of the Victorian 
uh, uh, what is it, um, Community Energy Legal Toolkit to have that uh, brought under a Creative Commons license as well. As part of the Victorian Community Solar Alliance, perhaps? Yeah, okay. That one. All right. Um, I've got loads of other questions. You could have, could you have a mix of renewables? What, what, what would like to know more about franking? I'd, I'd love to know what the status of is of, of, the, of those floating solar panels in relation to flooding is, but we're all out of time. <laughs> no effect. Yeah. Yeah. Not affected by flooding and they'll be installed in the next month. And, uh, all of us can't wait till that's happened. Cause it's, uh, there's been some, it's the first time this technology has been deployed in Australia and there were no Australian design rules. So the poor buggers had to go and develop rules and get them endorsed before they could build it. Uh, so everyone's learning. It's all about <laughs> learning, isn't it? Fabulous. Well, um, Adam and Kylie, thank you again. I really appreciate, we all really appreciate hearing your first-hand experience. Um, and uh, yeah, best of, best of success into the future and, and hoping to see you supporting other groups doing projects soon. Um, everybody else, uh, this is the last webinar on the small scale community solar guide. Um, uh, but do look out for bonus content um, and, and I'll, leave, I'll leave that teaser there. So keep an eye out on your email and we'll have a little bit of bonus content coming your way. Um, but also get into uh, the other webinars. So next week we're hearing about, I believe it's the Finance Toolkit, um, next week and the week after. And there's a whole schedule running through um, October, November and the first week in, in December same time, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. And we we'll hope to see you all uh, at those webinars as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Bye, Adam. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Kali. Bye. It's great.